Hey guys, Grandy Tamias here, and I've grown up on a lot of DreamWorks' biggest movies and franchises. Shrek, Over the Hedge, Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron, Megamind, B-Movie, Kung Fu Panda, How to Train Your Dragon, and oh gosh, Madagascar, that franchise was my childhood. And some of their recent movies have been exceptionally good, like The Bad Guys and Puss in Boots' The Last Wish. But today, I want to talk about their most recent film, Ruby Gilman, Teenage Kraken. Now, I know I'm kind of late to this discussion since the movie is already out on digital, but I just had some urge to talk about it. That might be because it was a financial failure, and I really wanted it to succeed. Because of that, I assume that there is a large portion of you watching who probably didn't see this movie, so definitely watch it, but I'll lay out the plot and then get to spoilers. So, Ruby Gilman, Teenage Kraken follows the story of Ruby Gilman, of course, who is a 15-year-old girl who lives in a town called Oceanside, where she and her family pose as humans, hiding the fact that they are Krakens, creatures derived from the ship-sinking sea monster of Norse mythology. Yes, Norse, not Greek, as Hollywood would have you believe. Anyway, Ruby's mother Agatha has imposed a rule where they are not allowed to go into the ocean, which hinders Ruby's plans to go to prom. While trying to ask out the boy she likes, Ruby ends up in an accident where she goes into the ocean and discovers that she can transform into the giant kraken of legend. Over the course of the film, Ruby learns about her heritage, how to fight in the ways of the kraken, and the kraken kingdom's rivalry with the evil mermaids, one of which is the new and popular girl at Ruby's school. Now, the trailers do spoil a lot about the height of this film's conflict, which I'll get to in due time, but everything I've set up to now is the gist of it. The primary reason I wanted to check out this film at first was to spend some time with a friend, and I thought she'd like it because, well, it just looked like a fun film. And second, it's DreamWorks, so I was intrigued by the film's concept and how they flipped the mermaid stereotype on its head. So both my friend and my little brother, who I brought along too, enjoyed it, as did I. And I recently saw it a second time by myself in preparation for this video. That, and I really wanted to give money to support this bombing film, even though it's futile. As for what more I can say before spoilers, the film's got a lot of charm and humor, like, especially in the first half, there were several moments I chuckled at. Since there are some scenes that take place at night or in the darkness of the ocean, there's a lot of bioluminescence, and I like the way that the colors irradiate the surroundings. It's really neat visually. I also liked the conflict between Ruby and her mother, and there are some really good messages about self-acceptance, coming of age, and how family members across generations relate. Okay, going into spoilers now, I'm going to start off with a few nitpicks and a few refutations to some complaints that I've seen about this film online. I will agree that the side characters like Uncle Brill, Ruby's father, and Ruby's Squad Solidarity were either too boring or too zany and over the top. With Squad Solidarity, I can kind of understand it's hard to make misfit school characters anywhere near as interesting as the main character without overshadowing them, and it's been a thing in other DreamWorks movies too, like with the other teen Vikings besides Hiccup and Astrid in How to Train Your Dragon. Probably not the best comparison, but that's what it reminded me of anyway. I wasn't too interested in the romance between Ruby and Connor, as well as the prom stuff. I'd say that was the weakest part of the film. Maybe that's just because I thought all the Kraken stuff was more interesting. I have also been constantly coming across reviews that the movie's plot is too predictable, and that other animated movies, like for example Pixar's Turning Red, have done similar things. I can't say too much about the Turning Red comparisons, since I haven't seen that movie, but from what little I know about it, I'm going to need more than just Teenage Girl from Canada turns into giant creature to say that they're similar. Granted, DreamWorks has been in this situation before with Pixar, but 3D animated movies take a long time to make, so I think that this is just another coincidence or people drawing too many parallels. But, so what if there are similarities to other movies? I tend to not to let things like cliches and predictable plot beats drag down my enjoyment of a film. I like to look at movies individually in this regard, and judge them only on how they implement those cliches and plot beats in the context of the story I'm currently watching. Even if I do draw comparisons, I don't let my prior perception of one have bearing on the other. I could understand the complaint if this were a sequel repeating cliches or plot beats from earlier movies in its franchise, but Ruby Gilman Teenage Kraken is the first Ruby Gilman movie, and probably the only one there will ever be, so I don't care what Pixar Movie X or Illumination Movie Y did first, I am watching Ruby Gilman do this for the first time in the Gilmanverse. 
Side note, for anyone who saw my Transformers Rise of the Beasts spoiler review, I touched on the same issue of cliches with the human characters in that film, and that any problems I had with them weren't the cliches themselves, but that they lacked depth. And for something like the parent-teenager arguments between Ruby and Agatha, it's hard not to go deep with that, so of course it's going to stand out more on top of feeling cliché. The story requires it. If you wanted to go into more detail about what you didn't like about the implementation of a particular cliché or trope or whatever, that's fine, but it should be confined to the film itself, and not just because I saw some other movie do it a few years before this one. However, you could draw parallels if you wanted to argue how one movie implemented something better, or how it could have improved, as long as it's within reason and doesn't conflict with the premise. That said, I do want to talk about the villain of the film, Queen Nerissa, aka Chelsea Vanderzee, and how she could have been done better. I don't necessarily have a problem with the film marketing itself on the idea of mermaids being evil and krakens being good. I mean, this is DreamWorks after all, the company that has made satire out of fairy tales and supervillains but they spoil Nerissa's monster form as early as the first trailer. I get that they gotta market the film with some action elements to get people's attention, but they could've obscured her in shadow or something to tease that, or misdirect the audience with another potential villain. Maybe Grandmama, or someone else I'll mention in a moment. Also, it does seem a little hard to believe that, even after being saved, Ruby trusts Chelsea the same night that she learned from Grandmama that mermaids were evil. Not to mention the idea of letting Chelsea even close to the Trident of Oceanus after learning what the mermaids did with it. I think it would have been better if maybe Grandmama hadn't told Ruby yet, maybe because she assumed mermaids were extinct and they had nothing to worry about, or she thought Ruby wasn't mature enough to learn about the atrocities the mermaids had committed. On that note, maybe they could have fleshed out the mermaid versus kraken conflict a little more by saying that Grandmama and Agatha disagreed on whether it was right to drive the mermaids to near or complete extinction, and that's what led Agatha to move herself and her family onto land. There's even some hints of this in the scene where they have a confrontation. As for Chelsea, she does mention that there are other mermaids who are in hiding, but we never see them, despite what the film's poster shows. Maybe this was left on purpose in case the filmmakers were able to make a sequel, and while she does say that the Trident would be able to help them by uniting mermaids and krakens peacefully, that was a lie. So, it would have been a little more threatening in my opinion if Nerissa used the Trident to rally a couple more mermaids as subordinates before going on her revenge quest. Which, now that I think about it, reminds me of Aquaman's Trident and how it lets him summon other sea creatures. So that's one option. It doesn't fix the predictability of Chelsea being a villain, but like I said, it's not a big issue for me. Though it could have been mitigated if the film had tried making Gordon Lighthouse a bigger threat. Maybe the movie could have gone into more backstory about his prior encounters with Kraken, because he does claim during the tour at the beginning of the movie that he saw one 15 years ago. Hmm, how old is Ruby? It's likely Gordon saw Agatha during one of those big Kraken battles with the mermaids, or saw her around the time she moved on to land. Perhaps Gordon hunting Ruby could have been the reason she learns to fight to defend herself, and maybe as part of Chelsea's lie, she convinces Ruby to get the trident to have an even better chance of scaring him off. And that's how Chelsea tricks Ruby so she can get the trident for herself. Also, if you're thinking Ruby could just stay on land to avoid Gordon altogether, maybe Ruby just really likes the ocean. She does read Marine Biologist Quarterly, after all. Or Chelsea tells Ruby to stand up for herself, and that she shouldn't have to stay out of the ocean because they want to spend time as Super Sea Girl besties. Maybe this is all bending the premise a little, and while I think the film is fine as is, perhaps this would have fixed some issues for a lot of those naysayers. Now that I've gotten through all my negative and negative adjacent thoughts, and potentially rewriting a large chunk of the film, I'll move back over to more positives as well as little quirks and random observations. Ruby Gilman as a character is really likable. I'm sure a lot of kids can relate to her or look up to her in some way. Family drama doesn't usually grip me in movies, but I was thoroughly engaged during the scenes involving Ruby and Agatha. Even the non-dramatic moments were great, like when Agatha calms Ruby down by telling her about the time she saved a beached whale. That was really touching. And I like that Ruby's love of math actually played into the plot, like when she says that the first rule of being a mathlete is to evaluate the problem. And in the final battle, when she says that because of the exponential growth formula, all three Krakens had to use their laser eyes, or, I'm sorry, electrically charged bioluminescence, to destroy the trident. 
As for minor characters and funny side things, I liked Ruby's little brother, Sam, like how his main personality thing is that he loves dodgeball. There was also Ruby's dog, I guess, named Nessie. I'm not sure what the story behind her is. Maybe she was brought over when the Gilmans moved on to land. She was pretty funny, like when she fooled Agatha into thinking Ruby was asleep, and when she pretended to be a baby kraken to fool Gordon. Near the beginning of the movie, in Ruby's video presentation, there's a parody of the keyboard cat with a Puss in Boots plush toy. And having shown my brother Puss in Boots 2 and the other Shrek movies a few months ago, he immediately recognized it. Oh, and I guess I'll mention here another Turning Red comparison. Again, I haven't seen that movie, but I know it deals with puberty issues, and that's why the girl turns into a red panda. This movie does have a moment where they make a puberty joke, but it's just in that one scene where they're all at home and Ruby's arguing with her family. The difference here being Ruby's transformation isn't caused by puberty, it's not central to the plot. The animation in this film is stellar. I was worried after the bad guys and Puss in Boots 2, DreamWorks was going to abandon their normal CG style. Like, the former was made to look like a children's storybook, which it's based on, and the latter has an oil paint aesthetic which fits with the world of Shrek. And a lot of people attribute this stylization trend as being started by the first Spider-Verse movie. Don't get me wrong, I like that, but I don't want it to lose its novelty so quickly. Ruby Gilman looks closer to a lot of 2000s and 2010s DreamWorks films, like with the lighting and rendering, but for some reason I can't imagine the characters in this film standing next to ones from those the way that I could imagine Alex standing next to Poe or Shrek next to Toothless. You know what I mean? Maybe it's just the character designs. Faces, joints, and hands look smoother and rounded, especially for the Krakens, which makes sense. They don't have elbows, knees, or any skeleton for that matter. I referenced the Canada joke earlier, but I'm not sure if this movie is actually set in Canada, but I know they have coastlines that look like this, but this could be a number of US locations as well. Okay, so I just looked it up. The movie's actually set in California. Huh, no wonder Agatha's a realtor. Housing's at a premium over there. One detail that my friend and I found interesting is that Ruby's Kraken form has three tentacles, while Agatha has four, and Grandmama has six. I wonder what the deal with that is. Do Kraken grow more tentacles as they grow older? Maybe it's answered on the Blu-ray, special features, or something. I don't know how I didn't realize this at first, but Chelsea's name is a little on the nose. Chelsea? Get it? Like I said, flipping the mermaid stereotype on its head was already intriguing, but they also went as far as designing her with red hair and blue eyes like Ariel from The Little Mermaid, which coincidentally had a live-action remake earlier this year. Heck, Gordon Lighthouse even calls Chelsea a Little Mermaid. This isn't even the first time DreamWorks has made fun of The Little Mermaid. Remember Shrek and Fiona's honeymoon montage in Shrek 2? Man, this studio really hates Disney, and I'm all for it! Also, I wonder what happened to Chelsea after the film's events. Did Gordon let her go? or did he decide to keep her in a fish tank or something as a tourist attraction? That'd be kind of immoral, though, but then again, she was evil and tried to kill three Kraken and caused a lot of property damage. If Gordon did let Chelsea go, is she still attending Oceanside High? She's probably going to be shunned by all the other students. This next bit could have easily gone in the refutation section of this video, but I'll include it here because it exemplifies a positive. As I stated with the premise, the Gilmans aren't allowed to go into the ocean despite living right next to it. That may seem counterintuitive or dumb or just plot convenience, but it's not. Uncle Brill literally asks this question to Agatha, and she says that the salty sea air keeps their skin moist. Seriously, how have so many people missed this? I was never going to ask for perfect consistency in a movie with mother flippin' mermaids, but I like how well thought out the logic of this movie is. Things are explained in detail, like with only the women in Ruby's family being able to turn giant, Nerissa saying that mermaids don't age, and I can't think of any glaring plot holes. Plus, they name drop other sea monsters like Leviathan and Umibozu, which are from the Hebrew Bible and Japanese mythology, respectively. And Brill does mention a devil whale near the end of the film, which Ruby then goes to fight. I found all those really interesting. In fact, I'd say there's enough material for a sequel. I don't think it needs one, but I would welcome it. But of course, that's never going to happen, and I want to take this as an opportunity to say something that DreamWorks should be warned about. As much as I'm anticipating Kung Fu Panda 4 next year, and as hopeful as I am that there will be a Shrek 5, I don't want DreamWorks to stop making original films. Sure, not everything has to spawn a franchise, but Ruby Gilman has a lot of potential. My point is, DreamWorks should not be taking the wrong message from this, 
as plenty of other films, both sequels and originals, bombed in June as well. It was an overcrowded month, but that's not the only reason. I didn't see any marketing for this movie outside of the internet, which started when the first trailer released in March, a little over three months before the film's release, instead of six months like most other movies today. So how did this happen? I can assure you, aside from making the film, DreamWorks had nothing to do with its release. This whole mess falls on its current parent company, Universal, who also owns Illumination, which has a film called Migration that they were going to release on June 30th, but Universal swapped it for Ruby Gilman. Probably because Illumination movies are known for making a lot of money, in no small part to these guys, Universal wanted it to have less competition, and so they put Ruby Gilman in that spot to die, and Universal had something to put on their release calendar for June. They knew anything in that spot was going to fail, and are only trying to recoup what they can, so it won't be so much of a loss when Migration comes out. Thanks a lot, Universal. You're no Disney, but this... This is deplorable. I feel so sorry for DreamWorks because I'm sure they had staff who were very proud of their work on this film. This really could have been their next big franchise now that How to Train Your Dragon ended, and is getting a live-action reboot, and we're probably never getting Madagascar 4 after Gloria's husband slapped Marty, but alas, the world is dictated by money, and Ruby Gilman's future at DreamWorks looks doubtful. So, despite its imperfections, I love this film. It might be my favorite I've seen this year so far. Even though it's no longer in most theaters by now, I'd still recommend supporting it in whatever way you can, whether it be buying it on digital, Blu-ray, or watching it on streaming. And I definitely recommend watching it with family and or friends. Anyway, I'd be interested to know, what did you think of Ruby Gilman, Teenage Kraken? Do you think it should become a franchise? If so, what do you think a sequel would be about? With all that said, I hope you enjoyed, have a nice day, and thank you for your time.